Hello, welcome back to Speakeasy. I am still Paul F. Tompkins, and my guest today, star of Stage and Screen, you will remember him from the HBO series The Wire, and currently you can see him uh, on Orange is the New Black, streaming on Netflix. Binge it, people! Please say hello what? to Pablo Schreiber. Pablo, hello! Maybe cheers. Cheers, thank you cheers. for being here. Thank you, thank you. Just right off the bat, can I get this out of the way? Please. I'm a very competitive person. Is that so? I, I am. And I learned in your lobby that there's a record for the most drinks in one interview. Yes. Three. Oh, that's right. Set by, I'm going I, for four. I believe that was set by Andy Richter, um, who had three Bloody Marys. Oh. Okay, I got you a hear? female name, but... Judy Greer? Yeah, <laughs> could have been. Judy Greer may have had three glasses of champagne. Okay, well let's today set so the record are, for we're four. drinking Kier Royale. Kier Royale, which so is, I hear. It's not a not alcoholic drink. No, but it's close. It's yeah. kind of... <laughs> it's about as close as you can get. If you're gonna have four drinks in one interview, right. make it a Kier. It's refreshing. Okay. Well, here we go. We're on the start of history being made. This <laughs> Can we have another Kier Royale from Mr. Schreiber? <laughs> Don't worry, it won't all be drinking. We're just doing. We will get down to the good yeah, stuff. Yeah, we're promise. just doing Kier Royale shooters okay. just to listen <laughs> up. <laughs> Pablo, thank you very much for being here. Thanks for having me, man. You've been a part of so many uh, amazing things over the years, both on Broadway, on television, and film. You were nominated for a Tony. That's kind of a big deal. It's kind of like the Oscars <laughs> for theater. <laughs> right. That's what they tell me. So you 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 were you didn't start out in the theater, right? I did, yeah. Yeah, I started out in New York City. I went to a theater uh, conservatory. I went to Carnegie Mellon University. In Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. In Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I am a Keystone Stater. I'm from Are Philadelphia. You? From yes. Philly. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. So you got that whole Rust Belt uh, Absolutely. vibe. That's right. Do you have a Philadelphia accent? I don't hear it. Not anymore. Okay. When yeah. I knew I was going to show you business. speak very well. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, so yes, Pittsburgh, I did college there, and then I went to New York, and as soon as I got to New York, I, uh, I started doing theater, and I have stayed as close to that as I can throughout my career. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the, you always go back, right? I do, you know, the last three years have been the, the biggest absence for me, mm -hmm. um, and that's just because I have kids, and it's hard to do the schedule um, yeah. with the eight shows a week and whatnot. Yeah, yeah. I mean, because it's, it's kind of a punishing schedule. It is. It's very tough. Yeah. It's very tough. I mean, literally eight shows per week. That's uh, one more than there are days in the week if you're not very good at math. And, uh, and it's, yeah, it's brutal. It's brutal. You get Monday off. That's basically it. Right. Um, and, you know, if you're doing a show, which I always tend to do really dark and emotional and heavy stuff, mm -hmm. I'm not sure why. Um, especially lately, I'm like, let's do some comedy, please. So you're on Orange is the New Black. I am, it's correct. While your character says a lot of funny things, there's a lot of stuff that is very enjoyable that your character says. It's, he's not a light guy. No, he's pretty <laughs> dark too, but, but there is, I mean, that's the closest as I've gotten to outright comedy. Right. Um, just because the filter is non-existent. You mm -hmm. know, the guy is basically, will say anything uh, and will do anything is he's the absolute worst human being you may ever meet in your life. Yeah, you play uh, you play George, who's a prison guard. George, yeah. George Pornstache Mendez. Pornstache Mendez. You you have a mustache on the show. I do, yeah. But it's not a real mustache. Well, I mean, I knew you were gonna say that because you're a mustache guy. I knew you were gonna call me. It had out to come here. up. It had to come up. It's true. They glued it on. Mm -hmm. They did, and uh, that was because I personally would never wear one in public. Some people like you can pull it off, Paul, but I don't others... like the way you said like you. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're just gonna have to get used to it. I've only had one so far, so I get That's meaner true. as the interview goes oh, on. Oh, fantastic. So you felt like, I just can't walk around with this thing. Have you ever had to for a role? No, I mean, in all honesty, I don't grow a mustache. Um, is it just too sparse? It's like a duster. Do you know what a duster is? <laughs> yes. It's kind of like that. It's like the thing that you grow in high school right. when you're 13 years old. Right. And I am blessed with that as a 35-year-old. So uh, you had worked previously worked with uh, Genji Cohen, who who uh, who runs uh, Orange Is the New Black on Weeds. Yeah, she's a genius. Yeah. So she had you in mind for for this role. You know, I don't know if she. I don't think she did. Uh, she. I got the script, and uh, my agents were were very intent on me playing. Uh, Jason Biggs' character, which is Larry, mm -hmm. uh, because it was, I guess, probably the biggest male role. But she, and then so they pitched that idea to her, and she right away said, no, that, that's not a great fit for her. Mm -hmm. And uh, and she said, you know, look at the script and see if there's anything else that you like. And I, I read the script, and I read uh, the one scene that Pornstash has in the pilot. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought, well, this guy's pretty outrageous. He might be fun. And I had a, a friend who was working in the writer's room, and so she told me that there was a lot of good stuff coming up for Pornstash. Inside I information. I know. It's, it's, everyone's doing it. So, it's <laughs> simply everyone these days. 
Oh, hi. Mm. You may have noticed we took a little bit of a break there. We had what we call in the, around here in Speakeasy a Max Greenfield situation. <laughs> Where I guess Mr. Schreiber is elected to remove his sport coat. Yes, is that better? You feel better? Yeah, oh, it feels good. It feels great. And we're up to, uh, this is the second drink. We're on the second drink now. Yeah. Oh, Going so for the can we cheers again? Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Oh, we can cheers every time. Perfect. Mmm. Mmm. <laughs> so. I love this um, show. Orange is the new black. You riff some outrageous things as porn stash. Um, and everyone seems to enjoy it. Like, the, the writers will let it happen. The, the, the they director do. will let it happen. They're okay with it, yeah. And yeah. it seems like the more outrageous, the more they like it. They encourage it, mm -hmm. in fact. Yeah, pretty much as far as I could go right. was as far as I went. And right. they said, yes, please, more. Right. Have you read the book that the uh, that the series is based I on? I did, yeah. yeah. It's a great book, yeah. great book. And the book has a very sort of uh, political conscience. I think she wrote it for the specific purpose of addressing um, criminal justice, uh, overpopulation in the prisons, and the show, if it addresses that, I think it addresses it by by proxy. You know, it it, it um, it's really a fun show um, mm -hmm. that that uh, lets a lot of characters sing in a really really great way, especially female characters. Obviously, it's a yeah. it's a, a show about women prison. So, well, and a, and a lot of this is this is a, a a lot of people are are rejoicing that here is a show that has more female characters on it than we've seen ever. maybe ever, right? Absolutely. In the history and. You know, and, and it's it's an amazing ensemble of people. Yeah. Um, and uh, I mean, is that something that, that, does it feel different on the set? Do you kind of notice that, you know, or is it just actors are actors? Paul, are you married? Yes, I am. <laughs> so you know what women are like. <laughs> I know what at least one woman is like. <laughs> okay, right. <laughs> Hopefully more, but uh, yeah. So if you gather 30 of them in one room, right, uh, and you only have one or two men, <laughs> right. uh, I think you can imagine kind of the vibe on set. It's, right. it's the absolute opposite of what every other TV show feels like. Mm -hmm. You know, every every other TV show virtually is, is male dominated, mm -hmm. and you have this very kind of testosterone vibe. The show that I'm shooting now, Ironside, is going to be on NBC, and, and that's very much like a cop action drama right and uh, and that's what TV shows usually feel like mm -hmm. and then there was this one which was uh, not only 35 women speaking roles per script mm -hmm. but it was in a prison where everyone is sequestered into one tiny little thing <laughs> right. and by its nature everyone was kind of on top of each other and uh, it was just it's a just a wild atmosphere right. <laughs> a lot of backstabbing and um, <laughs> Smiling and you know, women sure. stuff. That's what women do. Yeah. We all know what yeah, they're come like. On, come on. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, here we go. Yes, absolutely. It's time. Mm. Cheers. Cheers. Of course. Okay. You are now tied. Oh, I'm sorry, I spoke too soon. You are now tied. Thank you, sir. You're now tied. We're back, and we've added a fan. Is that going to be an issue for a sound? No, couldn't. No? Couldn't. How could it be? Oh, okay, fine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, so you've, you shot uh, Orange is the New Black here in Los Angeles. No. No? No. Oh, wait, where did you shoot? New York City. New York City. So you and your family lived in New York City for many years. Yes. Uh, but you just moved here to Los Angeles. Yes, I did. And how did you get here? I got here by way of a pickup truck mm -hmm. with a pop-up camper, <laughs> which we towed behind it. And a pop-up camper is, I'm trying to picture it, it's what it sounds like, Paul. It has, uh, it has a. It's something that you camp in, right? And it pops up, right? It's the thing that you uh, you may have seen when you were a kid. Your parents may have had one, or they didn't. But if they did, it was a thing that went, and it raised up, and then it went out like that with two beds on each side. That's a pop-up camper. Is this? I can't a... believe I have to explain this to you. Well, it... you've never been outdoors, have you? I, I once. I didn't care for it. Uh, is this a, a vintage piece of equipment? No, it's actually a, this was a modern one. They're still making these. They're still things. making Are them. Are they still hand cranked? <laughs> <laughs> that seems like a flaw. It really is, isn't it? I could completely agree on that. How Why don't I have a push button pop camera? How long did it take you to crank this thing up? It's, let's say, 45 seconds to crank it up, okay. and there's quite a bit of muscle involved in it. Right. There's not, yeah, My wife can't do it by herself, we'll put right. it that way. So it's a real family project. It is, it really is. <laughs> did the kids enjoy this? They did, they had a great time. Yeah. They went through BC, South Dakota, uh, Yellowstone National Park. Very all, nice. All over the place. Very it was, nice. a, it was a cross country exodus. How long of a trip was this? This was a month and a half. A month and a half? Get out! So this was not just, we're gonna just go across the country. This is, we're gonna go all over the place. We're yeah. gonna see this beautiful continent. Yes. 
pretty much. I, I'm, I'm from rural British Columbia, from the Canadian mm -hmm. Rockies, so I wanted to go and see my, my home. Your and, ancestral homeland. Yes, my yes. homeland. And uh, so we did that, and uh, on the way we wanted to see Yellowstone, which mm -hmm. I hadn't, uh, I have two, two boys, they're one and four, mm -hmm. and uh, some people would say that that would be a mistake, taking a four and a one-year-old on a camping trip, mm -hmm. after having done it, I would agree with them. No, I, I see, I see. Mm -hmm. So there were maybe some times they did not feel like waiting for their home to be cranked up for the evening. <laughs> uh, you, you're originally from Canada. Mm. You, you came to the United States when you were 12? I did. Yeah. Jesus, you do research. I barely. Uh, <laughs> Somebody does. And you come, you come from a theatrical family. Okay. Uh, <laughs> if you say so. Is that not so? No, it is. Your father's an actor. Yes, it is. Yes. Is he still acting? And an acting teacher, as it was when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Did he ever teach you the craft of acting? Well, only by uh, osmosis. Right. <laughs> Did you always know that's what you wanted to do? Uh, no. <laughs> no, <laughs> I didn't. I, I spent a lot of time being in reaction to it and wanting to uh, mm. to not do it. As uh, when I was in high school, my uh, my father w was uh, had was just being done with being an acting teacher, mm -hmm. and my brother was uh, starting to appear in movies. Mm -hmm. This and is Liev Schreiber. This is Liev Schreiber. Yeah. Uh, Ray Donovan, as it were, this summer. No one can ever know Ray Donovan. No, he's a fixer. <laughs> Fix that shit, by the way. Time out. <laughs> oh, sure. Cheers. Cheers. Here we go. Okay. Record breaking drink. By the way, that's how you're supposed to drink these, right? Oh, cameras. Hello. <coughs> uh, we're back. The record has been shattered. Pablo Schreiber is the new speakeasy <laughs> interview champion with four drinks. <laughs> <laughs> How does it feel? How do you feel now? I feel fantastic. I'll um, bet you do. <laughs> yes, I do. Uh, this is a great interview. You are a great interviewer. Thank you. Have this I, is how it should be all the time. I said that time. before, didn't I? It, you can say it. You can fantastic. never say it too I'll much. I'll say it more Absolutely. as we go along. Absolutely. Uh, the Wire is one of the greatest television shows of all time. I'm a huge fan of that show. Working on something like that, that was a, I think at the time, that was a very, that was a, a pretty significant uh, part for you at that point in your career. Oh, right? it was massive. Yeah. Yeah, it was like my second gig ever. That show took me until the the first episode of the second season. Okay. When it it oh, clicked. Boy, that's racist, Paul. It's it's very racist. Now look, I've gone on the record. <laughs> but you know you had, you had to wait for the white people but to see, show up, didn't but you? See, <laughs> that's that's is, amazing. That I is, can't believe you just said that. There is a the thing though. People that are too gung ho about the second <laughs> season, it's like, okay, yeah, calm down. take it easy. Calm down. It's a black show. You know that, right? But it's the, the pacing of that show is uh, is it's been compared to a novel that yep. it unfolds very slowly and very deliberately. Yeah. But the truth is, every season's kind of like that. Every season yeah, of The Wire. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. You, you don't really get pulled in until episode five or six. Yeah. And so it was the same thing. But the first season is uh, more like that because the production values were not great mm -hmm. early on in the season and they were still trying to find their their um, their stride. Yeah. And they did by episode five or six and I was totally engaged and I saw the possibilities of what it could be. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, honestly, like if I had been hired to be on, on One Life to Live at that point, I would have been thrilled. Absolutely. You know what I mean? A, a job is a, a job is a job. Absolutely. And uh, and it just turned out to be, you know, the gift that keeps on giving. Yeah. Uh, have you since seen the entire series of The Wire? Have you watched all the seasons? I have, yeah. Okay. So, in, and you, of course you briefly reappear in the fifth season, yep, right? Correct. There's a scene on the docks yep. and we see Nick Sabaka again. Yep. Um, Which is brilliant, isn't it? I mean, you yeah. see him in like a complete passive, he's like an extra in yeah. the scene or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's the genius of the series is yeah. like, this character that was one of the stars of the second season that we like fully invested our our care and God, I hope he makes it through. Mm -hmm. uh, and suddenly he's like the guy screaming in the background mm -hmm. at the political rally. Yeah, that's the genius of the show. Seeing the whole thing and seeing uh, uh, your part in it, what mm -hmm. what is the what's the takeaway for you of that whole thing and having been a part of that series? The takeaway for me is I feel um, just uh, so grateful and blessed to have been a part of this thing that to me is, you said it, it's the best TV show ever. I, I won't repeat your words, but to me it's the smartest TV show ever made in the sense that it is examining the, it's examining a, a city and the inner workings of a city in its entirety in America. And because of that, looking at the causes of poverty in America and to, to do it the way that David did it um, by separating each season and looking into a certain facet of the city in each way, it's just, genius and I, I don't 
I haven't seen anything on TV that has approached its um, intellectual heights in terms of what it was trying to accomplish by, by shining the light on us as a society. The series we're working on now is, a, is, a, is an update of Ironside, yeah. which was a TV show, I want to say late 60s, late 60s early 70s. Early 70s, perfect. Um, uh, Raymond Burr as Raymond a Burr. Uh, detective. God, I wish uh, I had my cell phone on the best picture. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> what is the picture? It's Raymond Burr in a wheelchair with like destructo four wheel tires going, <laughs> going over cars. <laughs> it's the funniest thing you've ever seen. <laughs> This Anyhow. was, back then, uh, every every detective had some sort of gimmick, and his right. gimmick was he was in a wheelchair. He was in a wheelchair. Um, so yeah. this is this is People an update. People called him lazy. Right. <laughs> it wasn't true. It was not true. It wasn't his fault. No, most of the people you see in wheelchairs are not lazy. Not at all. Yeah. So you you were not playing the, the titular role. I am not playing the guy who's, who's in the wheelchair. No, Blair Underwood's taking that role, and he's doing right. a fantastic job of it. Mm -hmm. It actually, it really is a fantastic performance. I saw the pilot, and mm. he's strong and complicated and wonderful and dark. And I play one of the detectives that, uh, that has his back. Are you the guy who pushes him around? No. Because he's got a motorized wheelchair. You know what? Things have changed since the late 60s, early 70s. Technology has progressed. Right. And he actually pushes himself. Right. That time out. <laughs> Cheers. Here we go. Now, okay. this is... You've not just broken the record, I'm you're now shattering it. the record. I'm the Barry Bonds of Speakeasy. I don't know who's gonna do five. And, no, and we're not done yet. Nobody. It's true. I mean, <laughs> seriously, how long does this show go? We can go, look, I got nothing else to do all day. <laughs> me neither. But nurse this drink and Is watch you Is there anyone get drunk. else coming after me? Nope. Let's fucking stay, bro! <laughs> oh, can you say? Yeah, to the internet, fuck, right? Fucking curse fucking all you fucking a want. P.F.T. When you walk what? through the garden. <laughs> okay. um, all right. We're back. We're back, and we're back. <laughs> <laughs> how has, you, you've, you've mentioned your kids uh, a number of times, how has being um, a father impacted the choices that you make with career stuff? Yeah, it's a balance, it's hard. One thing that happens when you have kids is suddenly you're not the center of your own universe. Mm -hmm. uh, there's something else there that's so much more important. And it's, uh, it's actually the most liberating thing that you could ever imagine for me personally. Right. Um, because I, I didn't have to worry about myself and, and what was I gonna do and all the angst that, that happens when you're a young man. Everything was about them. And so that becomes difficult uh, as an artist because I want to make choices based on just me, on my artistic integrity, and obviously money becomes uh, a question. But uh, thankfully and wonderfully, I haven't yet felt uh, compromised as an artist, mm -hmm. which is a, also a really wonderful thing. Yeah, uh, I had this this uh, really long dialogue with myself as a young man in my twenties about what it was to be an artist. I was looking at people that I really admired, that were amazing artists that I wanted to emulate, and and most of them, I observed from the outside, were a little bit crazy, mm -hmm. and were not the nicest people in the world. Mm -hmm. And I wondered. Do, do, in order to be an artist, do you have to be an asshole? Do you have mm -hmm. to be psychotic? Do you have to be crazy? And I don't know the answer to that yet. All I know is that as I'm uh, carving my own path as a father and as a family man, that I have dove into the role of a dad and into the role of a good person. And uh, my work has only gotten stronger. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, you know, Maybe I don't have to be an asshole. I don't think that you do. Thanks, Paul. I, yeah, I don't. God, it's good to be here but, with you. But you I, because I know exactly the thing that you're talking about, and yeah. I don't think those things are mutually exclusive. I yeah. don't think. I think you can be a decent person and still do good work. You I know? sure hope so. <laughs> yeah, I, I think sure so. Hope so. I think so. I'm trying. I, I think it's that it's. It maybe it seems that way because the people that are assholes or are crazy or whatever, all they have is just that thing that right. they do. You know. Right. And so. I think they're the ones that sort of make it all about that, right? As opposed to uh, other people assuming that's what you have to do because yeah. they're insane people. Yeah, you know? let's call out <laughs> all insane people right now on this show. You guys, by name. You're insane. I'll take this camera. You take that camera. Okay, ready? <laughs> yeah. D Just kidding. <laughs> we have Schreiber. Would you Would you like to finish this? Oh shit! Damn. Unprecedented. 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 Here we go. I mean, this is... Not unprecedented because he offered me his drink. Unprecedented because he called me my older brother. <laughs> Did Cheers! I really? Cheers! <laughs> Wait, how 
How did I do that? I haven't I, even. I, I it's on camera, Paul. That. It's on camera. It can't be. Cut this it's out. It's on camera. Cut this out. No. It I'm going to dub it in. It, it won't be edited. Some ADR will fix this. Mm, Ray Donovan. Here we go. <laughs> no one can ever know him. Porn stash. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen. I feel like I should probably go home now. But, Do you think that's a good idea? Probably. Okay. <laughs> Daddy, you smell funny. Oh, shit. <laughs> Why are you so young? Ladies and gentlemen, Pablo Schreiber. He has done it. Oh. He has broken the record for most drinks drunk by a guest. He's also the only guest to have drunk my drink. Uh, Pablo, thank you so much. What a pleasure to have you here. Here they are. Please, I hope we're getting a, a lovely shot of this. Pablo Schreiber has done it. He has not only shattered the previous record of three drinks by drinking six drinks, he has also gone on to drink a seventh drink, the last of which was mine. The first guest to drink the host's drink. Pablo Schreiber, we're all proud of you. <laughs> the tongue was too much. Wow, it was too much. It was at, too much. At the exact moment, that was like I say, a porn stash. We're That's all proud thing. of you. Yeah, just exactly. Over the line. Yeah, over never, the line. Sometimes that character just lurking, just okay. just off to the left. Uh, how do you feel? I bet you do. Yeah. You want to get a drink? Yeah, sure. Let's get out of here. Okay, let's go. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe and check back every Monday to see who I interview next. And for more info about Speakeasy, visit MadeMan.com.